China is currently engaged in the construction of the largest water diversion project globally, a bold initiative that appears to challenge nature itself. This ambitious endeavor involves the creation of artificial canals, aqueducts and tunnels spanning thousands of kilometers, even crossing literal mountains. The primary objective is to transport fresh water to the arid industrial centers in the northern part of the country. In this video, we will closely examine China's South to North Water Diversion Project, exploring its cost, the underlying motivations, its environmental repercussions, and assessing how it may or may not bring benefits to the Chinese population. Throughout its extensive history, China has grappled with the dual aspects of its geography, experiencing both blessings and curses. The west to east flow of the Yangtze and Yellow River systems has facilitated permanent human habitation in eastern China for thousands of years. With fertile floodplains supporting agriculture almost year-round, this region has been capable of sustaining a continuously expanding Chinese population. Notably, China's Yellow River Valley stands out as one of the largest and consistently developed arable land areas globally. On the contrary, the northern and far western regions of the country pose challenges due to their dry or mountainous nature. From the Taklamakan and Gobi deserts in the north to the formidable landscapes of the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau, much of China's northwest remains sparsely populated and unsuitable for agriculture. This contrast is accentuated by the fact that 94% of China's population resides east of an imaginary line that distinctly divides the country into two contrasting halves. Historically, the capital of China, Beijing, and its surrounding northern cities have played a central role in the country's population, agriculture, and trade. However, with China experiencing unprecedented population and wealth growth in the mid-20th century, essential resources, particularly water, became increasingly scarce in the region. Northern cities, including Beijing, had long relied on groundwater to meet the needs of their populations. Unfortunately, due to the rising demands of urbanization and industry, this finite freshwater source became overexploited. Compounding this challenge was the expanding Gobi Desert in China's Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region, accompanied by more frequent dust and sandstorms. At least 409 million people in China have been affected by a severe sandstorm that's hit the country from Monday. Each year, an alarming 3,600 square kilometers, roughly twice the size of Luxembourg, of grasslands were succumbing to desertification a consequence of human activities like deforestation, climate change, and notably the depletion of underground water sources. By the early 1950s, it became increasingly apparent that northern China would struggle to provide sufficient water to its growing population. Cities continued to expand, while water resources dwindled. Faced with this looming water shortage, Mao Zedong, the founder of the People's Republic of China, proposed a solution in 1952 transferring water from the water abundant south of the country to the arid northern regions. Stating, quote, water in the south is abundant, water in the north scarce, expressing that if possible, it would be fine to borrow a little. After extensive planning and research, this vision was approved by China's State Council in 2002, marking the official commencement of the South North Water Transfer Project a mega-project aimed at creating a network of aqueducts, tunnels, reservoirs, and dams to transport fresh water. The project comprised three major canal systems known as the Eastern, Central, and Western routes. The Eastern route, originating near the city of Yangzhou along a major branch of the Yangtze River, involved a substantial pumping station to transfer water onto the Jinghang Grand Canal, the world's longest fully constructed artificial waterway. The water then traversed an underground tunnel beneath the Yellow River and was further directed through a series of aqueducts toward the coastal city of Tianjin, bordering the capital Beijing to the northwest. The entire length of the eastern route exceeded 1,100 kilometers. Construction on the eastern route commenced in 2002, with an initial expectation of delivering fresh water by 2013. However, due to multiple construction delays, this timeline was extended by over four years. By 2017, fresh water had finally reached Tianjin, providing an estimated volume of 1 billion cubic meters annually and directly benefiting up to 10 million residents in the city. Unlike the eastern route of the massive water transfer project, the central route faced a distinct challenge, as it lacked pre-existing infrastructure for diverting water. 
the commencement of construction on this route was considerably more complicated. The central route originates at the Denjiankyu Reservoir, where significant adjustments were necessary to facilitate the smooth flow of water downstream toward the north. The Denjiankyu Dam underwent elevation by as much as 15 meters to raise the water level within the reservoir. The strategic adjustment eliminated the need for pumping stations, allowing water to traverse canals and aqueducts seamlessly. However, this alteration to the dam led to the relocation of over 300,000 people from Hubei and Henan, as their homes were affected by the expanded reservoir and canals. The remaining portion of the central route comprises artificial canals and aqueducts, forming a network of elevated and underground waterways across the Chinese central plain. Noteworthy is the Shehi Aqueduct, stretching over 12 kilometers above the Shehi River. The route concludes at its destination, Beijing, the capital of the nation. Construction of the central route was completed in 2014, covering a distance of over 1,200 kilometers. Following its completion, approximately one-third of the water that previously flowed through the Han River was diverted, posing challenges for the millions relying on the Han for fresh water. Consequently, in July 2022, the Chinese government announced plans for a substantial underground tunnel. This tunnel, situated one kilometer below the surface, would connect the Three Gorges Dam to the Han River, ultimately supplying water to the central route leading up to Beijing. Upon its completion, the planned underground tunnel will stand as the longest and deepest artificial waterway ever constructed. By the year 2030, the central route is anticipated to transfer around 12 cubic kilometers of water annually equivalent to roughly a third of the entire capacity of the Three Gorges Reservoir. In contrast to the eastern and central routes, the western route of China's South-North Water Transfer Project is still in the preliminary planning stage and presents the most formidable construction challenges among the three. The envisioned plan for the western route involves establishing a network of waterways and tunnels connecting the Yangtze River to the Yellow River via the Qinghai Tibet Plateau, situated approximately 3 to 5 kilometers above sea level. The challenging topography and climate in this area make the project exceptionally difficult. Moreover, the direction of the western route necessitates engineers to carve through mountains to navigate the intricate terrain. The completion of the western route is estimated to occur by the year 2050, potentially benefiting a combined population of nearly 100 million people along its path. While unofficial plans have circulated in the past regarding the diversion of water from transboundary rivers originating in China, such as the Brahmaputra and Mekong rivers that flow through India and Southeast Asia respectively, these have never been officially endorsed. Nevertheless, concerns have been raised by India about China's potential impacts on the Brahmaputra. The Indian government has expressed apprehension over China's potential to manipulate the flow of the Brahmaputra River raising concerns about the implications of such control. Conversely, the Chinese government views the South-North Water Transfer Project as a substantial success, even though it has not yet reached full completion. According to Chinese state media, the project is already benefiting up to 140 million Chinese citizens in water-scarce regions. Despite the overall positive outlook from the central government, varying opinions exist among local and provincial authorities in China. Southern upstream provinces like Sichuan and Hubei opposed the plan to redirect the Yangtze's flow to the north, citing potential adverse impacts on the region's water security and hydropower sector. Conversely, western provinces such as Gansu and Qinghai see the construction of the western route as a source of much-needed socio-economic and agricultural stability for their regions. While the project has demonstrated benefits for some northern Chinese cities, it has sparked concerns among local and international environmentalists. The South-North Water Transfer Project comprises artificial waterways that disrupt the natural west-to-east flow of China's rivers. This construction has led to the interruption of hundreds of natural rivers, with some drying up entirely due to the artificial diversion of their natural flow. Due to the immense size and volume of water transported by the South-North Water Transfer Project, a staggering 600 rivers have vanished during the course of the project's construction. With industrial waste and sewage, finding their way into these artificial rivers. For instance, on the central route originating from the Denjiankyu Reservoir, industrial cities like Xi'an dispose of their industrial waste into the Han River, which flows directly into the reservoir and eventually into the central route leading to Beijing. Given that a significant portion of these man-made waterways traverse hundreds of cities and villages across the country, 
many individuals, businesses and industries use them as dumping grounds for their refuse. During the initiation of the project's central route, the natural flow of the Yangtze River was curtailed by as much as 36%. This raised concerns among experts who feared the possibility of a significant backflow of seawater from the Yellow Sea into the local water supplies of coastal Chinese cities like Shanghai and Nantong. If the diminishing flow of the Yangtze persisted due to increased diversion into artificial rivers, there was even speculation that salt water from the Yellow Sea might extend back into the man-made canals themselves. Such an eventuality could potentially trigger a nationwide water crisis. Another pressing environmental issue is a key reason for the prolonged planning stage of the Western Route. The official proposal for the Western Route includes the construction of tunnels through an extremely mountainous regions of China. The implementation of the Western Route covers the risk of triggering landslides and causing environmental damage to the local flora and fauna posing substantial challenges to its progress. Furthermore, the Kangai tibet Plateau, where the western route of the project is planned, is a seismically active region. The construction of such a crucial mega-project in this area could potentially incur billions of dollars in costs for the Chinese government in the event of a major earthquake. Presently, two out of the three planned routes of the South North Water Transfer Project have been completed. However, this achievement has come at a significant financial, environmental, social and economic cost to the Chinese government and its people. The total estimated cost of the entire project is around 62 billion USD, and this figure does not include the additional billions required for the maintenance of over 3,000 kilometers of canals, aqueducts, dams, tunnels and reservoirs. Despite the substantial financial investment, the original objective of providing clean water to China's north is yet to be fully realized. Given these considerations, what are your thoughts on the South North Water Transfer Project? Do you believe that the project's benefits outweigh its environmental costs? Should the construction of the Western Route still proceed? Feel free to share your opinions in the comment section below. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video.